With me today is uh, Debbie Mikula and Ann Surink. Um, we're going to talk about the Library Privacy Act amendments that were just signed in December. Um, all of you know Debbie Mikula. I'm assuming you all know Debbie Mikula as the Executive Director of MLA. Uh, and MLA was essential to the uh, passing of these amendments and the wording of these amendments. And I'm sure all of you or most of you know Ann Surink, uh, who is an attorney with Foster, Swift, Collins and Smith uh, and does an awful lot of library law. Uh, as well as municipal law and several other things. Um, and we're all going to kind of take a piece of this and afterwards uh, we will take some questions. Um, so uh, you can go ahead and type some questions in chat and we'll try to address them as we go, uh, the three of us, but um, anything not addressed during the session, we will try to uh, address when we're finished. And anything that's left after that, uh, we will send in a separate email so that everybody gets answers to what they uh, what they ask. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, Debbie, uh, would you like to start? And if if you want, uh, I'd be happy to advance the slides for you if you uh, cannot. Yeah, you... Why, don't, why don't you do that, Claire? Sure. So I'll just let you know when. Okay. So I'll go to the first one. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we always have to have our disclaimer um, whenever you talk about law. So that's uh, that's this. Um, make sure that if you have any questions, you're going to hear over and over again during this presentation to please contact your attorney. Um, this is a particular issue that is can be very complicated and is not black and white all the time. So it's very important that you have your hand on your um, attorney's phone number so that you can contact them when you need to. Okay, Debbie. Good. Can everybody hear me? Are we all good? So um, I just want to, I, I want to thank most of you before I even begin. Um, many of you were um, a part of this whole process of, uh, of amending the Privacy Act and we're, MLA is just very appreciative of everyone's contribution to that. Um, but we started in a, a kind of a strange way. It's taken over about a year and a half to go through this process. Um, and, and I think that starting at the beginning of why, what, why we're amending this, why we amended this, and why we took the stance to amend it is really um, a critical piece of the conversation. So um, libraries have, I mean, just think about, um, you know, the ability to, you know, if a crime is committed and then not, and then, um, and I had to ask Claire what this word was this morning, it just couldn't come to my head, but, you know, law enforcement really did consider a lot of libraries to be hostile witnesses because of this Privacy Act and not being able to share, um, being able to share the library records. So, um, and that, I think that is one of the core values of libraries and we wanted to make sure that we protected that part of the, the work, but also then gave um, the ability for, for libraries to work in partnership with law enforcement when a crime was committed. So um, I think libraries were um, some of the... I, some of the only entities that did not have the ability to share information in a, in a really a timely manner. So... Um, Many times what happened was, you know, that uh, when at, with the act put in place, um, law enforcement would ask for, you know, who was that? What was their address? I mean, you have all of that information, but um, what, what was happening was that we, because of the Privacy Act and not being able to share those records, um, we were, you know, we're, we're often seen as, as uh, imp impeding the, the process, impeding the, the, you know, the gathering of evidence um, for those kinds of things. And what we wanted to try to do was to try to find a way a, to go around, a, around that um, and make sure that libraries had the ability to share information in some way. So 
the language that came in the in the in the the Library Privacy Act um, initially before we started to put this the you know, the amendments together was really nebulous. Um, it was um, it was very scarce. Libraries five miles down the road were doing something different than you know the library on the other side of the you know on the other side. So um, we really wanted to make sure that those differing opinions by attorneys and by others were. Um, 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 were addressed um, and that we came out with, you know, um, uh, new information. And as you all recognize, I think the, um, uh, the, the technology has changed over the course of the last, what, 40, 40 years or so when this was first produced. Um, you know, the technology of, of surveillance, video surveillance and things like that was really something, um, uh, and cell phones and all of the kinds of things that we're up against now were not addressed in the first Privacy Act. So you can move this slide. Um, so I'll give you a quick time frame. Um, we are, uh, we started this in the fall of 2019. Um, MLA was approached by a single library director that had some concerns. Um, and, and immediately before we could even get some of our work and our processes put together, um, we were being very reactive to um, those, those concerns. Um, and by the time we start, by the time we even got a small committee together, Senator McGregor um, over in Kent County had already proposed legislation to update the Privacy Act. So on October 31st, we were we were being reactive to something that was being presented um, into, um, uh, uh, into the legislature. We don't ever want you to do that. We really would like to be proactive when we, it comes to this. And because the Privacy Act affected school, academic, and public libraries, um, there was a lot to take into consideration. So, and there was a lot of conversation and a lot of um, a lot of vetting that um, that we needed to to do before we felt comfortable. So, um, so the vetting took place between about December and February. We surveyed the, as you remember, probably we surveyed the MLA membership. We gathered input. We enlisted the help of the ALA chapter relations and the um, the um, uh, the uh, intellectual freedom uh, uh, attorney from ALA, and we finessed the language. Language. We made amendments to it and, and um, substitution language that was then accepted by Senator McGregor. We worked in really wonderful partnership with Senator McGregor. Um, in March, before COVID hit, <laughs> uh, we had um, one full committee meeting. Um, it was the day before everything got shut down um, with the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and then uh, uh, they voted um, to kind of move it forward. Um, but as you as you recall, you know we were in the middle of of COVID. Um, the closure stalled all legislation proposed, um, and so we went back at it in October of 2020. Um, went through the second committee meeting, um, and the Senate voted. It was a unanimous vote by the Senate to move forward with the changes um, of the. Um, of the, um, the substitution bill that Senator McGregor had put together. We then got to work on the House um, and in November and December, we went through the same process that we went through with the Senate. We went through the House Judiciary Committee, the House voted um, and the House voted um, with only two, two negative votes. So we felt very, very comfortable with that, that this was being accepted by the legislature. Um, and uh, then we had to go through, there were a couple of changes made at the very last minute. Um, we were working in partnership with the ACLU. They had a couple of concerns. Um, and so we took a little bit of the language out of the mix um, and kept moving forward. So at December 28th, uh, the governor, uh, we were at the very end of the process and the governor finally signed into law and we are now 
Uh, it is now called um, Act 315 of 2020, and the law will take effect 90 days after that signature. So approximately March 28th, um, we wanted to give it time to do some education, um, but approximately March 28th, this law will go into effect. Um, and De Debbie, I'm sorry, I, I just got a note from somebody that I inadvertently put 2020 on there. I'm still getting used to the new year, um, so I will fix that. But yeah, it is 2021, just to be clear. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't even see it. <laughs> so next slide, Claire. So we really had to, there, it was a balancing act and I'm, I'm, you know, Claire put some of these slides together. So, um, and, and I'm, I'm, but I'm really glad that it goes in this process. Um, I think that, that we had to consider the original purpose of the act was really to protect patrons privacy um, and not allow for, um, you know, for people to um, get into the, the library records. Um, and we wanted to protect that. We wanted to protect their reading record and, and, the, um, and, and the things that they, they do within the library. So, so there were definitely boundaries um, that we were, we were making sure that the value of, of what librarians believe um, was being protected at the same time, making sure that we were able to go in the direction of, of, of if a crime had been committed, whether it was um, pornography, whether it was stealing videotapes, whether it was um, taking a bike off the rack or never, you know, never returning a laptop computer. We wanted to make sure that we had the ability to talk about those things. And, and again, I'll, I'll just reiterate, at the time that this first Privacy Act was, was written, technology and information policies were pretty non-existent. So, um, and um, we weren't sharing information with, um, you know, collection agencies, to, for, you know, for, for books uh, or for, for the lending practices. Um, we weren't sharing um, within the co-op system and with the ride sharing and the, you know, all of that. So all of those things needed to be taken into consideration as we um, moved into this. So, so what we did was we really we wanted to substitute some of that language and and really re re-emphasize the definitions so what what is crime uh what is a law enforcement officer um you know or who are those people and we went back to the and i know claire and ann are going to get into more detail but we went back to some more of the 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 already the 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 laws that were put together we wanted to clarify that video surveillance was not a part of library records, um, as long as it didn't show, it didn't, um, and that we could turn those things over to law enforcement. Um, um, so we needed that, we needed that clarity because again, one library down the street was doing something different than, you know, somebody five miles down the road. Um, we wanted to clarify um, about um, the information that you know uh, that you know um, about a person or about the knowledge that the personal knowledge that you have. So we wanted to clarify that. Um, and, and we really wanted to make sure that the liability questions were answered in terms of how um, um, uh, the qu consequences of the violation and then who was who was responsible. So and and was there liability um, for the library directors or any of the staff that were um, putting that together. So there were a couple of other things that we took into consideration, um, but we really we really stopped the um, a, a couple of things that came came up in, in our conversations um, with the ACLU about um, 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 making sure that um, we, were, we were doing due diligence on some of that. Um, some of the language that we even started with with Senator McGregor got um, pulled out of the um, pulled out of the final um, substitutions. Um, and we're really happy, I think, that we had so much we had vetted all of the information from you all um, as library directors or as staff and, and from outside sources so that we, we had, we came out with the very best, um, uh, best um, substitution that we possibly could. So um, I would not suggest, not, I know Claire will emphasize the whole, you know, ask your attorney, but I will also emphasize the part of advocacy about if you have something that affects the entire state, 
we would really like to make sure that MLA is integral to the conversation. Um, and, and if you have issues that we would, we would be able to vet um, the, the conversation and make sure that we're capturing um, as much um, of the, 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 the way forward um, as, as we possibly can, because that's really an important part when, when so many large, small, rural, urban, um, school, academic, public are all affected by this, um, this act. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire um, and Anne and let them take you through the, the real details of, of what you now have to do. So thanks very much. Oh, I was muted. Thanks, Debbie. Um, we appreciate that. And we all appreciate uh, all the work that MLA puts into advocacy. Um, and I, at least for me, I don't know what we would, where we would be without MLA. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the first part of uh, some of these changes. And then Anne is going to jump in with what I think is the more difficult part of, of these changes. Um, so the overview of these amendments, just from a kind of a bird's eye point of view, are uh, the major changes were some additions and amendments to some of the definitions, um, some uh, amendments and changes to the disclosure um, requirements and prohibitions, and then some clarification of the penalties involved uh, in infractions or violations of this. Um, and one thing too to, to understand is that uh, the Privacy Act is actually split into two halves. And the first part of the Privacy Act deals with um, this idea of disclosure of information, of the patron information. Um, the second part of the Act deals with uh, protection of children from uh, sexually suggestive images on the internet. Um, and that that part, that second part of the Act was not really affected by um, this other than part perhaps the penalty portion, but um, that second part having to deal with, you know, filtering um, and or over or supervision of computers or overview, that has not really been affected uh, by these, uh, at least directly. Uh, so that's one thing I just wanted to mention. So we're going to start off by looking at the definitions. Now, um, definite, I love definitions in statutes. Um, it's one of kind of the, the unsung heroes of legislation. Whenever you look at a statute, it can be very daunting to look at a whole act, you know, the beginning of, a, of statutes. Um, and in the, usually in the first couple of sections is where the definition section will be. And I think a lot of people skip over it. Um, in my years of teaching law students, uh, it was very common for them to just kind of hop over the definition uh, because, you know, they're boring. Who wants to read definitions? And um, you want to get to kind of the meat of, of the issue that you're dealing with. But definitions are very closely connected, right? Because legislation is all about words. And if you're reading a statutory section that says what you can and cannot do, and it uses certain terminology, you need to understand what did the legislature mean by that term. And, and you know, sometimes what the legislature has in their mind is not what you may think of the common definition um, or it may be a definition you're not aware of. So usually, the hopefully, the legislature in those circumstances will list what they think is or what they understand or what they intend the definition to be. Um, when they don't do that, there's a whole, you know, uh, statutory construction process, but which we're not going to go into today. But uh, right now, what I want to convey is always look at the definition section of a statute. Um, it's not the most sexy part of a statute, but it, it's very important and it can add clarity and really give you the answer uh, to what you're looking for. And if you skip it, you really run the risk of misinterpreting um, the statute and misunderstanding what it is that you you know you're supposed to do or can't do so in this legislation there were three definitions within that definition section that were affected there is an additional definition that was added within the text which um, we will discuss later but within the definition section um, crime law enforcement uh, and library record uh, crime and law enforcement were two that were added 
Um, those were definitions that had not existed in the prior statute um, or the unamended. And library record, uh, which was included, but that was amended and clarified a bit. So let's start with crime. So this is important because part of the changes that we'll discuss later talk about, you know, a library uh, being able to disclose certain information and staff being able to discuss certain things um, as it relates to a crime in the library. So it's very important for to understand what a crime is, uh, what is meant by crime, what circumstances uh, would permit uh, you know, library staff to utilize these new amendments. So the statute says that um, crime means the term as defined in section five of the Michigan Penal Code, and then it gives the, the citation. Now that's not very clear, right? So that kind of leads you on this little um, scavenger hunt where now you have to go to a separate part of the Michigan Compiled Laws and you have to look up the Michigan Penal Code, um, which is not difficult. And I know for some people that might be daunting and you might be tempted to skip it, but I would encourage you again, you know, the, it's important, especially in the beginning that everybody understands, you know, what, what the do's and don'ts are. Um, and essentially here, you know, it says crime is an act or omission forbidden by law, which is not designated as a civil infraction um, and is punishable upon conviction by certain things. Um, so one of the things that's important here is to consider what a crime is and what a crime isn't. It doesn't mean you have to know the entire criminal code, but for example, um, you know, if you are, um, if you are uh, uh, having a patron viewing pornography, um, pornography in and of itself is not a crime, right? Um, there are many, you know, legal authorities that say you have a First Amendment right to view pornography. So, you know, I've gotten calls from libraries, and I'm sure Anne has too, that, you know, well, you know, this patron was looking at, you know, naked people. Well, it's okay to look at naked people in the library. What, what you have to be careful of are, you know, um, things like, um, you know, child pornography, or, you know, uh, then there's obscenity. What is obscenity? You know, obscenity is illegal in Michigan. So, you know, that definition of obscenity, which we discuss in other trainings along intellectual freedom, is how do you identify obscenity versus pornography? Uh, so those are some things to keep in mind uh, when you are considering, you know, what is a crime and what isn't a crime. You know, is truancy uh, really a crime? Is, you know, some of this, you know, is things, again, you, at least in the beginning, you're going to want to make sure that you talk to your attorney because there may be certain acts that, you know, the library feels strongly are not okay, but they might not raise to the level of crime as the statute sees it. Um, so, you know, and that is, you know, that's important to understand. Uh, because that plays into when, what, under what circumstances can you release some information. The next one was law enforcement officer. So you may think again, well, this is kind of stupid. You know, we know what law enforcement officers are. Um, and, you know, again, this is an individual license under the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards Act. And again, it gives you a citation that you then have to go look up and it lists the, the, uh, positions I've listed here. Um, now, again, you know, some of the, the people you might not see here are things like, you know, certain security guards. You know, the, the resource officer at a school is very often a police officer. Sometimes they're on duty or off duty police officers. But again, there may be other entities that come to your library requesting access to information and you have to ascertain, well, you know, if you can disclose something to a law enforcement officer, is does that person, is that person a law enforcement officer as intended by the statute? Um, and most of the time, this will probably be pretty obvious. But, you know, again, there are circumstances when it may help to understand what the law means by law enforcement officer. Then the big one is library record. 
th this one was amended, right? So a lot of us are probably used to, you know, a document record or other method of storing information retained by a library that contains information that personally identifies a library patron, right? Including patron's name, address, or telephone number. That was all in the statute before, right? So obviously patron records where, you know, the person's address, phone number, picture, all of that is counted as a library record and of course their reading history right or identifies a person as having requested or obtained specific materials so again who checked out what when they checked it out and over the years this could also include things like signups for computers um, registrations for a library program you know some of these could be interpreted in different ways this was also that last sentence um, and uh, personally identifies a library patron was the sentence that very often made many people, including myself and, and I believe Anne, feel that library surveillance videos were counted as a library record. Because if you can see and identify a person's face in the surveillance video, it's personally identifying a library patron. Um, there were other um, uh, attorneys or legal professionals who felt differently. Um, and there are no, there was very little legal authority on this act. There's, um, you know, when judges and attorneys, you know, research to try to figure out what kind of advice to give and to try to figure out, you know, what was the intent of a statute and how does it work. One of the things you look at are, you know, what have other courts said? Right. So what have what have other courts or the attorney general or other other legal authorities, what have they said about this um, in similar circumstances? How did the court rule? Well, there's nothing on this. There's very little. There's no real cases. There's one attorney general opinion um, that is not tremendously helpful. So um, that caused a lot of problems with trying with people trying to figure out what how to advise people or just librarians trying to figure out what is the right or wrong thing to do. So what was added were these subsections, right? So library record does not include either of the following. Non-identifying material that may be retained for the purpose of studying or evaluating the circulation of library materials in general. In other words, your circulation statistics, the, um, your collection development statistics. If you want to know how many people um, checked out a particular book for weeding purposes and you want to say share that around with the library staff um, or perhaps you want to share it with the board, um, perhaps you, you know, want to use statistics for everything, as I said, from weeding to collection development, um, that's fine. You know, if you just want to know how many patrons do you have, if you want to know how many patrons do you have from a particular geographic area, um, if you're considering a contract renegotiation and you want to know how many patrons from a particular township or that is in a particular address range use your library, that's okay as long as it's not, you don't have names and specific information connected to it. So that kind of information that the library is using for its own use and for its own assistance and its own research is fine. And that's pretty much always been fine, but now it's laid out. Um, recorded video surveillance images made solely for security purposes that do not include images of any activity or any document or record that identifies a person as having requested or lawfully obtained specific services, materials, or information resources. So this is a little tougher, but essentially, if you um, have a you know um, surveillance video uh, outside your building, and it takes pictures of you know you're trying to investigate whether someone stole a bike, and you see on your video that you know uh, someone comes up and and you know messes with the bike rack and walks away with a bike. Um, and you know, there's nothing you can't you know see books in their hand or you, that's that's all fine. Um, if you know you in in the course of viewing that video um, surveillance footage, you see patrons leaving the library with books under the arm, and you can clearly read the books, and you can clearly see the person um, leaving the library, then that would be a problem. And that would be footage that you would want to um, maybe, you know, obscure, 
um, in order before you hand it over. Um, it doesn't mean you can't hand it over. It means that you would need to address that portion of the video that has that information that is identifying another patron or identifying materials that that other patron are carrying. Um, similarly, um, if you have a um, in the in the library, your um, you know, taking uh, surveillance footage and you are, you know, looking for someone sitting at a computer doing something illegal, whether it's obscenity or child pornography or whether it's, you know, peer to peer, illegal peer to peer streaming or whatever. Um, if you there's someone sitting next to them on a computer and you can clearly see the patron identify the patron and the information on the screen that they're viewing, then that also is a problem. And you would need to um, redact it or, you know, obscure it in some way before you handed it over. So it pretty much means that you need to just look at what you're handing over. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, you can't just hand over a surveillance tape or a, a digital file to uh, law enforcement without viewing it first and making sure that it doesn't contain information that under this new uh, law is inappropriate to, to provide. The other thing to be aware of um, is that surveillance footage, if it's no longer considered a library record, then it is no longer protected from FOIA. So that means that um, if you have surveillance footage um, and, and it is, again, you know, um, to the extent that it's redacted, um, surveillance footage people can request and you'd have to provide it and under FOIA redact the appropriate portions of it. Um, so that's something new that you would have to consider and put in your FOIA policy. And again, that's something your attorney can discuss with you and advise you on. And in addition, um, review your uh, records retention schedules because surveillance footage is, uh, you have to hold on to it for a certain amount of time. So libraries that, you know, erase it every day, uh, you may need to talk to your attorney about that um, because there is a certain amount of time you have to retain it uh, for purposes uh, of FOIA and purposes of uh, public records. Um, so disclosure of records. So uh, um, this is one that um, was amended um, and it, there was a subsection five here is the big one that was added. Um, so I'm actually, um, let me see what slide. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, well, no, I'll go ahead and do this and I'll hand the next one um, over to Anne. Um, so this says that a library or an employer agent shall not release or disclose a library record or portion of a library record. Um, and this is, this is the way it's always been, person without the written consent of the person liable for payment for. So again, that's the same. So if you're dealing with children, you know, you're looking at the person who is responsible for the materials that are checked out. So for payment for the materials or return of the materials in the library record. So that's all the same. Um, and it says that um, you cannot disclose unless one of these applies. And that's one is a warrant the court, you know, a court has ordered the release or permitted it, um, or um, the person has given written, written permission, the person who owns the record, or um, the release is permitted under subsection five. And so subsection five was new, it was added. And this says that you, you know, an employee or an agent of the library can disclose library records um, under either of these circumstances. So one is, um, it's, you may report information about the delinquent account of a patron who obtains materials from the library to a collection agency that is under contract with the library. Now, this has also been something that, you know, most attorneys have given, have said is okay, but now it's, it's enshrined in the statute. Now it's clarified. If you have a, a contract with a collection agency to assist you in obtaining overdue materials back, then you can share patron record information with that agency as long as what you are sharing is 
only the information necessary to obtain the materials back, right? So that doesn't mean that you hand over the entire history of the person who's checked books out. It means that you, you can hand over you know, the materials that the collection agency requires in order to help you get the materials back. Um, you know, such as maybe contact information um, and the list of materials. And then secondly, um, the library or employee or agent of the library may disclose library records to another library or library cooperative for purposes of conducting interlibrary loans. Um, and again, the records have to be limited to those required, um, the least amount required for being able to um, complete those interlibrary loans. Um, and that's, um, you know, which again is something that, you know, most most attorneys and most have felt that this was probably okay, but it was not very clear in the statute. So we were all kind of walking this line. Well, it seems like it's probably okay, but, and now it's enshrined that it is okay. You know, you can share information necessary about patrons so that appropriate interlibrary loans and reciprocity can occur. So to sum up, um, you can give information to collection agencies and you can share for ILL purposes. The important thing there is um, the least amount possible that you need to accomplish those tasks, um, both collections and ILL. Now, if you have two reciprocal libraries that share information, um, you know, back and forth. And a lot of times, let's say you have a large ILS, a shared ILS. And a lot of times with a shared ILS, um, you know, there are different uh, agreements that can occur that, you know, makes everybody privy to every, you know, all patrons information. But if you have a situation with reciprocity where you have, say, within a co-op, different libraries can, you know, uh, a patron can get cards at different libraries by virtue of um, being in that, their library being in that co-op. Um, you know, if you have a problematic patron, how much of a problem is it for one library to share information with another library about that patron's borrowing habits? Um, and this I find to be a very um, uh, complicated, very difficult question. Um, and again, and I'm going to ask Anne to weigh in on this, but but my feeling about this is that um, I think that this could be problematic, um, depending on exactly what information you're sharing, because you know there's a difference. Um, like I, I actually kind of lean on the side of not doing this. I'm, I'm not a real fan of this. I think maybe there's some factual situations that that maybe um, may may make it okay. But but I think that this is probably not a great idea. Um, I am going to actually hand over to Anne because the next slide is hers. Anne, do you have anything to weigh in on this? Oh, I just wanted to add one thing about um, that reciprocity. I, I agree with Claire. I think it, it needs to be very narrow, um, limited to, you know, sharing, you know, what typical interlibrary loan. One of the questions I get a lot um, will be, for example, let's just say you have a problem patron um, and it's not anything to do with their borrowing or circulation, but it has to do with their behavior in the library. Um, I've had a lot of libraries ask me, you know, especially um, libraries in more urban areas where you may be very close to another library, whether they can, you know, I guess, warn another library about a particular patron because they've been, you know, kicked out of their library and they fear that this patron will show up at a neighboring library. So I don't think that this provision here gives you the right to, to, to it doesn't, it's not so open-ended that you can share all information um, about a patron between, um, between uh, libraries. So just be kind of careful about that. Claire, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, I absolutely agree. This I've gotten this question a few times and I find this to be kind of troubling. So again, I urge you, uh, if you have a very strong, uh, situation and you feel very ethically required to, to send it, you know, provide information, I would contact your attorney 
and ask because I think that this is is troublesome. Um, so I am now going to uh, hand what I think is the more most complicated part of these changes. I'm going to let Anne, um, I'm going to throw Anne under the bus, so to speak. <laughs> I'm going to let Anne handle this. Take it away, Anne. I appreciate your honesty, Claire. <laughs> um, so one of the changes, you know, and one of the reasons that um, I think a lot of libraries were looking at changes to the law was that um, what it inadvertently did is it protects people who commit crimes in libraries, and in, in particular people who commit crimes against the library, for example, stealing material. Um, and so it put, it put, you know, I think as Claire and Debbie mentioned, you know, it put some libraries in a very, um, you know, difficult position because you're in a situation where, um, you know, you are seeking the help of law enforcement, but law enforcement asks you for information. You say, well, you know, help us, somebody stole material, but uh, we can't tell you who it was until you get a warrant. It, it, it's very mutually frustrating um, situation. So what this provision did was it um, added a, sub, a, sub, a subsection to the, um, to the Library Privacy Act, and it states that the section does not prohibit an employee or agent of the library from providing a sworn statement or testimony to a law enforcement officer based solely on the personal knowledge of the employee or agent of the library regarding a crime alleged to have occurred in the library. So there's there's a lot of parts to this particular provision. So I want to kind of deal with them um, separately. Um, it does um, apply to employees or agents of the library, and that is now a defined term, and we'll get to that in, in a slide or two. Um, and it talks about providing a sworn statement or testimony. Now, these terms are not defined, so I think this is one of the areas where we might see a little bit of, um, you know, questions about what it means and, and what it means to your particular library in a particular situation. Um, I do want to back up and state that um, the Library Privacy Act has been around for a while. Um, and um, one of the pros about the history of the Library Privacy Act is that, to my knowledge, no library has ever been sued under the Library Privacy Act. Okay, so when we talk about risk assessment, keep that in mind. The, the con, one of the cons is, is that no library has ever been sued under the Library Privacy Act. So we don't know where the limits are on what libraries can do. For example, um, you know, in other areas of law, like Freedom of Information Act or Open Means Act, there's lot, been lot, a lot of litigation, and it's the litigation results in court cases that show how the courts will interpret the provisions, and we can use that as guidance to, um, you know, guide our future behavior. But because there has been no litigation about these issues, we don't really have that guidance. So this is one of the challenges, I think, that's going to keep coming up and up with this particular um, law. But it's based solely on the personal knowledge of the employee or agent of the library regarding a crime alleged to have occurred in the library. So Claire already talked to you about crime. That's, that's a specifically defined term here. So we got to be a little bit careful about that. You know, for example, if, um, you know, if you see somebody looking at, you know, a Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition, and it offends a couple of your um, patrons, you know, for you to call the police, claiming that it's obscenity is probably a stretch. It's definitely a stretch that would not be a crime. And so there would be a problem with your revealing that information to the police in that instance. Now, for example, if um, someone uh, comes into your library and in front of staff um, punches another patron, that's clearly an assault, that's a crime, this, this provision would apply. Um, so, where, where this becomes really care, I think it's going to become really interesting is the solely on personal knowledge, because I think libraries have grappled with this in the past because we've, we've dealt with issues sort of tangentially with dealing with a, a, what's a library record or not. Is it your knowledge or is it your, your, um, your, um, do you know it because it's a library record? I think this is going to be the area that you're really going to seek need some help and it's going to be probably a case by case determination. I'll give you a for example. Um, let's say you have a patron that has habitually been stealing DVDs and you start to notice a pattern and you look up their their records um, and you see who the name of the patron is. Okay. Six months later down the road, um, 
you see this patron again, patron starts stealing DVDs again. And so the question is whether the name is now your personal knowledge or whether you have to, um, you know, regard every, you know, possible connection to a library record as not being personal knowledge. This is the really great area that I think libraries are going to have to deal with. And it's going to be sort of what I would recommend would be a discussion between you and your lawyer. Um, and it's going to be very situational. And I give the example too, because we talk about risk and risk is sort of a, and you know, as lawyers, we talk about, you know, we weigh the benefits and weigh the risks. Okay. So for example, if you have a patron who is stealing iPads, stealing very expensive items that you're checking out, um, and you know, you know who they are because you've been keeping your eye on them. It may be worth more of a risk to a library if you think that you're on the edge about whether it's personal knowledge, than if um, a patron is stealing, you know, 50 cent paperback novels. You know, again, the issues, the legal issues are going to be the same. It's just where the risk um, and what risk you're willing to take. Keep in mind, you don't have to release any of this without a court order. This is a voluntary thing. The library can make sort of a policy about what it wants to give out and what it doesn't want to give out. Um, this is really nothing new. Libraries have been sort of making these decisions, I think, um, behind the scenes. You know, sometimes libraries have chosen to violate the Library Privacy Act because the moral or the, you know, the cost or the social cost is too much. For example, um, you know, we've had several circumstances where police call looking for a, a missing child. And they ask if the child's in the library, have you seen the child? Um, many times um, libraries will go into the database to see if the child was there that day and checked out books and, and tell that to the police, just as a moral you know, safety you know, view, even if it might've been a technical violation. Um, and so you may have a different view of whether, you know, if it impacts what the material that the person's read, you may, um, decide that, you know, it should have a warrant versus, you know, someone um, who, you know, you may know, you know, may be stealing very expensive items from the library. So it, I, I don't have a good solid, you know, yes, no answer for you on all of this. First of all, it's new. We don't really know where it's going. Second of all, I think it's going to be very situational. And I know, uh, you know, people don't like that. They like, you know, if, if X happens, then Y. But um, this is one of the things that I think it's good to have a discussion with your attorney, figure out what your sort of risk level you're willing to um, engage in, and then, um, you know, go from there. I don't know, Claire, if you, if I have, do you have anything to add to that or, you know? Um, I, think, I think that you um, covered it, you dodged that bus really well, Anne. <laughs> um, and I think the, the point about, um, you know, if you understand the the kind of the history behind this law and what the real intent of this law is, as far as protecting, um, you know, the reading histories and and you know um, the the ability to obtain any information, um, then that also, as Anne mentioned, can help you make a decision. You know, the stealing of valuable material, you know, valuable items versus, um, you know, someone who is you know viewing you know, pornography that's not illegal. So I think I think that's an important distinction, uh, an important part of the analysis. And it just in, based on my experience, mo most of the time I'm brought into these situations, I think from a sort of from a, a you know, the, the intellectual freedom standpoint, I think they're pretty easy cases, because usually they have nothing to do with intellectual freedom, you know, vandalism, it's, um, you know, stealing, um, it doesn't matter what the title of the, right. of the DVD is, right. You know, they're stealing DVDs or stealing very expensive games. And so, right. you know, that, that, but that, again, that's something that the library is going to have to decide about what right. it wants to do, whether it wants to take the position that, look, we know there's a new amendment to the law, but regardless, we're still not going to change our um, stance that you have to have a, right. um, a, a warrant or search, you know, a, a court order. Some libraries are going to take this and say, we're willing to be pretty aggressive about what personal knowledge means because we lose thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every year of public money on these thefts. So, right. and there's they're going to be every library in between, or or to you know help with behavior issues, which again really don't have anything to do with intellectual freedom. Um, there, I just saw in the in the 
chat here, there was a question about, um, so this is an act, not a law. Um, acts are laws. Um, so what's what's uh, I think what's important to understand, and maybe this will help lessen the confusion, um, as Anne said, um, these amendments, they're not, a library is not required to, to um, you know, pass on the information. Um, the library can make that decision. Um, if you look at the language, you see that it says things like may or does not prohibit. Um, so it's important to just read it carefully. All of this that we're talking about is in the law. It is the law and laws not only, you know, come down in black, black line, you, you may not or you must not. Sometimes it's, you know, a little more nebulous. You could do this, but, you know, you don't have to do this, but you're not allowed to do that. So, um, again, to talk to your attorney when you're making those decisions to decide what's best for you and your and your library. Hey, Claire, this is Debbie. I, there's a lot of questions. So do you want to continue or do you want me to yeah. go back and feed you some questions or? No, let's continue. I'm going to go to the next slide and let Ann finish up. Yeah, the, the, the remaining slides are not as, this is sort of the meat of the, and I probably will have the most um, um, discussion. So in, we give you an example of a, if a staff witness a commotion where PDA between two you know, teens gets out of hand, one runs out of the library and the other accuses the escaped teen of assault, you know, and the staff are familiar with the teens who are regulars, can the staff tell law enforcement? I mean, I think there's certainly an argument under the new law that the answer is yes, because it's common knowledge based on your um, experience with the person, you know, if you didn't, you know, if you if you issued them a library card 10 years ago, and that's how you first were introduced to them, I think some libraries will take the position that it was from a library record at some point, so we're not going to give that information. Um, some libraries will say it's common knowledge. I didn't have to look at any library records to tell you that was, you know, little Jimmy Smith that did that. So I think those are the sort of the judgment calls um, that the, each library is going to have to make. Again, uh, I, well, I do want to reiterate it's optional. You're not required to provide law enforcement with these amendments. Um, I do think um, it's very important that um, you take an opportunity to um, meet with your local law enforcement and give them an idea. Of, we, we, you know, we, we suggest that, you know, that we, we give them sort of a training. You know, when you come to the library, we're going to expect that you have a court order um, because of the law, and this is what we're going to do. And so it's good to have that dialogue, I think, before you get to a crisis mode with your local law enforcement, um, it, particularly if you're still going to require um, uh, court orders before you give over records. But again, like I said, it could be situational. You could decide in one instance that you need a court order because you think it really um, skirts too much on intellectual freedom and you're not comfortable. You know, other times you might say, look, there's nothing you know, someone came in the library specifically to assault someone, they're not even, you know, a patron, they've never checked out a book here, they might have come in and read a newspaper, so we're going to give them the information. So those are the sort of this case by case decisions. Um, they have defined employee or agent, I think this is a good definition, Claire mentioned before that, you know, definitions are very good and, and key. And if, if they have one, you have to follow that definition versus the common meaning of a term. Um, but it does um, clarify that it includes an employee, the library member, the governing body, or an individual who's specifically designated as a volunteer and who's acting solely on behalf of the library, and any other person who's lawfully performing services that on behalf of that library under a written contract, including a collection agency. So again, this is why contracts might become important if you want to share records with, you know, some vendor. Um, and just to clarify, Library employees, full-time, part-time, all levels, governing bodies, individual trustees, and municipal governing bodies. I do want to be very careful for the libraries that are district libraries, for example, or maybe PA 164 libraries that have very, I'm going to call them active, participating municipalities or township boards. Uh, our, part our participating municipalities governing body is not going to be your governing body. So. If you are a uh, district library composed of a city and a township, the township board does not fall under this provision. It's only the library. So I want to be clarifying that. Volunteers, this is going to be important. And I think this is another reason why you should clarify your relationship sometimes with friends of the library, because you want to make sure they're actually library volunteers. 
um, volunteers who might be working at a Friends of the Library bookshop and are, are there because they are in the Friends of the Library would not be included under this provision. So you wanna make sure those distinctions are made and, and very carefully monitored. Um, and again, anyone um, performing services under contracts, database companies, collections agencies, IT security personnel, these are all common examples. Um, if you have a question, you know, your lawyer can clarify whether a contract person is, is covered by this. Um, one of the things I think has been very good about the, um, and it's always bothered me um, about the existing law is that um, if there's a violation under the prior version of the law, the, the person who was sued was the employee who provided the information, regardless of whether they had a justifiable position or not. Position or not. And now there's penalties have sort of been divided. Um, you can, patrons could sue the, the library itself or individuals for, who are responsible for disclosure. And I want to explain the difference between the two. Oh, oh sorry. Yep, yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> sorry about that. I was looking at the chat. I, was, I got lazy and relied, relied on Claire. Sorry about that. So if a library or an employee the agent violates section three, which is improperly discloses the, the, um, the record, um, the library is subject to liability of the person identified the record um, and the person identified um, can bring a civil action against the library for actual damages and um, or 250 whichever is greater actual damages is hard again I said there's no case law in determining what that was you know if you you know improperly released a record it got to the press the person lost their job because of it there might be different ramifications because that's one of the things i get well the, the police will look at this and they'll say well it's just 250 bucks i'll pay the 250 bucks if you'll give me the record but it it doesn't mean just 250 bucks in all cases plus reasonable attorney's fees um you know some people might think that's an oxymoron but anyway attorney's fees can be expensive if if, if you um if, if you're sued because you know you're gonna have to you know, pay for their attorney's fees and yours. Uh, but again, those inadvertent disclosures or disclosures where you thought it was okay, but it, it just turned out to be that it was not, um, those are against the library, okay? So that's really important. That's an important change. Um, um, so um, penalty number two is um, similar to the, the penalty that was in place before the law changed. Um, but this one, if you see now, it's an employee or agent of the library knowingly violates section three. So that's a, that's like an intent. Like you have to know what you're doing is wrong and you do it anyway. There's no basis for you to believe that, you know, you could be doing the right thing. You knowingly violate it. Um, you know, if, you know, you, you give records out to, to the police knowing that you should have a court order. Those are the types of things where then the person could bring the action against the individual employee instead of just the library. I wanna switch the slide. So if the disclosure is made intentionally um, or if the person disclosing the information understood that they were improperly, again, this is, um, they can sue the individual. I think we've covered that. Um, so, and this is important that just that last bullet point, sorry, <laughs> I'm not making No, I'm sorry. I just didn't want you to feel like you had to go over everything. All oh, over again. Uh, if disclosure is knowingly done, um, the library and the individual employee could be liable. So it doesn't have to be just one or the other. I think that's an important thing to know. All right. This is the other thing that I, um, I thought was a good addition because um, it puts a very short statute of limitations on this. That if 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 a record is disclosed, in, you know, and the person wants to bring a suit, they have to do it within 180 days after the date the person becomes aware of this. Um, we, this was 180 days is um, the statute of limitations for Freedom of Information Act denials too. So it's, it seemed like a good fit for you know record disclosure issues to have that same. Um, so that same statute of limitations, which means that you don't, if you find out you improperly disclose something, you don't have to have this hanging over your head for years or, you know, six years and two years, which are typical statute of limitations. So I think that's a good change for the library community. Um, so what, what should you do? I think everybody should read the new law, become familiar with it. Um, review and revise your policies to make sure they're in compliance. Um, the two that I see that stick out to me are 
um, your surveillance policy, if you have one. Um, you know, we, you know, a lot of the policies that I've drafted, for example, talk about library privacy and what you have to do if you get a request for surveillance. Um, so that's one policy, for example. The other policy I see that needs to be um, specifically amended is your confidentiality policy because, um, for example, the ones that we've drafted specifically deal with surveillance video. We did that because um, I, for, I believed um, that surveillance videos were considered library records um, and we wanted to specifically address that in library policy. Your FOIA policies may also deal with this. Um, I don't typically like policy FOIA policies that are so specific that they deal with specific things like if you get a request for surveillance video, you do X, but some of you may have policies that are that specific. So the, those are just the three that, that you know, bring to mind to come to change. You might want to talk about your um, or look at your patron behavior policy as well, because there may be some things in there that deal with that. Um, retrain your staff. I think um, staff should understand what the changes are because oftentimes they're the ones that have to make decisions about library policy. We typically recommend that no decisions to disclose records to third parties are made um, by somebody who's not the director or the appointed person of the director or at least the highest person, you know, at the, you know, at the library at the time. But certainly everybody should be trained at least to uh, identify the issues involved so that they can um, you know, move the decisions up the chain in, a, in a, um, an expedited way. And again, we already talked about this a bit, but forge a relationship with local police so you, they can discuss your policies with regard to patron privacy and, and disclosure. If your library is going to take the position that under no circumstances, regardless of the new law, that you are going to not disclose records without a court order and you want that to be your policy in all cases, you can do that. I'd recommend it be in your written policy and then that way it can be communicated very effectively to law enforcement. If you want to do it more on a case by case basis, then I think just explaining to law enforcement that you have the option to do either and you, you know, so that they should be aware that at times when they come in, they might get the records, they might be required to get a court order. Those are some of the issues that you might want to discuss. Claire, is there anything else that you're muted? Claire? You're muted. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> One thing I think that may need to be addressed, and Anne, you can let me know if you think that I'm, you know, maybe overthinking this. But um, so it, um, since since the liability for knowingly is is individual, um, I don't know if there is a conversation about. Um, you know, sometimes what an individual staff member thinks is correct is different from what the hierarchy thinks is correct. And if you have a situation for an, where an individual staff member perhaps does not think they should divulge, but the higher ups feel that it's okay. Um, I don't know if there needs to be a discussion with uh, personnel policies or, or that kind of decision making policies since the individual employee I'm guessing would be on the hook if if they did it um, when their bosses told them they should do it if they felt they should not do it. I, I certainly think that should be a discussion among the staff about what what to do in that circumstance. Um, I, I think that um, you know, whether it should be in a policy or uh, employment policy or not, I'll have to think that through. Um, but I certainly think that um, sort of the, the, the people that are in leadership at the library probably need to take more of the responsibility because I do think it's probably not good for morale if, um, you know, if, if that, if the, you know, the, the brand new um, library employee is kind of pushed out there. Okay, you, you <laughs> right. the record. <laughs> I, you know, I, like I said, I, there hasn't been any litigation on this. Right. And so, you know, I just don't, I just don't know what, what would happen. Right. Um, and I suspect it would be very hard to show intentional violations. So with this new change where the library is on the hook, I think um, staff can breathe a sigh of relief, um, especially if you get, you know, sort of approval from your director or, you know, consultation with your, you know, your attorney about whether the, that should be disclosed. But, right. Um, again, it's great that no one's been sued. No one, I don't especially want any library or any of my clients to ever be the test case. But, but like I said, because of that, it's hard to know where the edges are. 
Right, absolutely. And, and I'm also thinking that maybe uh, this would be a conversation with your um, uh, insurance company as well um, for as far as the board is concerned and the, the library liability, just just a touch base to make sure that your library would be your policy would cover something like this. Chair, do you want me to feed you some questions from the um, yeah, go ahead. Um, Anne, are, are you okay with that? Yeah, I've got a hard stop at 1120. So that that's my only. <laughs> that's fine. Sorry that's about fine. That. We're only scheduled to 1130 anyway. So that's, that's not bad. I've got about 30 minutes of questions. Here. Yeah, okay. So, so first question, I'm going to go way back up to the top of the chat, but um, from Kristen, does does law enforcement include federal roles such as ICE, FBI, CIA, blah, blah, blah? You mentioned, I think the slide mentioned state, state and local. Right. Um, no, um, this, this is what the statute says, means an individual licensed under the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards Act. Um, and I do not think that it mentions federal officers, but I think federal officers are covered under other uh, yeah. acts like uh, Patriot Act and um, go ahead Ann. Yeah I think I, I, I briefly I briefly looked at when I saw that question and Claire was talking about another subject I briefly was looking into it and it doesn't specifically address that issue but 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 keep in mind the things that most likely you you don't have to give over the record okay so keep that in mind if there's a question about whether you think someone's um, um, covered under the act, I would stop, not give them the record, consult your lawyer and figure out if that person is covered. Secondly, most of the, um, most of the, um, most of the time it's going to be a local law enforcement agent anyway, because they're the ones that are tasked with investigating state crimes, which will be your typical assault, your stealing, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's typically what's covered. The federal government will come in on Patriot Act issues and it's likely, you know, there's gay, there's been gag orders in the past and all that, but I just think those are probably few and far between to the point where if that happens to you, it's going to be major enough where you should be talking to your lawyer anyway. Right. So I guess in that case, if there's any question about whether that agent is appropriate under the law, I would stop, talk to your lawyer. But I do not see immediately in my quick reading of it, federal agents covered primarily because this is a state law. Right. And, you know, they only have jurisdiction over state officers. Right. So the next question came from Westland. Um, for information on the library records, how does this impact patrons on their information? One of the gray areas our library has had was informing the patrons of whether we can tell them what books they've ordered often over the phone. Is there clarification on that? I don't, that, the new law doesn't cover issues no. like that. So the short answer is no. But um, Claire, jump in if you get a different opinion. I, no. Sort of what I, I always put myself when I when I talk to you know libraries about this, I say, well, you get information on the you get you get private information on the phone quite a bit, correct? Like for example, if you call your doctor's office, they'll give you the test mm -hmm. results over the phone. What do you have to do in order to make them comfortable that it's you talking to them? Name, address, date of birth, some of those information where you can come up with a policy in your library that you will ask for certain information before you will, you know, that you feel comfortable that actually makes sure you're talking to the person that you're supposed to be talking to. So I, no, the new law doesn't really cover that, but I think there's ways you can um, discuss things over the phone, especially in COVID where you feel comfortable that you've got the right person. Claire, do you? Yeah, I had someone one time ask me the name of one of my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So the next question is about security videos where the camera system is owned and operated by campus police. Videos would include lots of lawful activity. Do we need to limit access or location of cameras? Um, no, the only one I know of limiting access would be like bathrooms. You can't have them too close to bathrooms, but I, I don't, I, go ahead, I think, Ann. I think it's a decision that the public body makes as to what where you want cameras. Um, I know that um, we've denied access to um, 
you know, it, it, you know, I, the campus security puts a little bit um, different, you know, because I think it's going to come down to whether that's an, under the control of the library. So again, I think that's it's pretty particular because most most libraries are going to have their own system and are not going to be observed by others. If you have um, if you are, if your library is being observed by another entity, I would approach that entity and work out some sort of, you know, at least come to an understanding of what they think would happen. Because most likely, for example, if you get a FOIA request, if you're a city library, the city sets up surveillance. If you're a university, it's the university sets up surveillance. You might not be aware of a request for information. It probably goes to the city. So I think to the extent that you have people you know, video cameras that are surveilling your library. I think that you and whatever agency has those um, cameras should come to some sort of understanding of what you think should happen under this and with the understanding that this law should be consulted as well. Well, and, and hopefully some of that's already in place because if you have been sharing, if you're, because I've gotten this question in, in, but usually in context with a municipality, like I'm in a building, I should, the building is shared between us and the city mm -hmm. and the city has cameras and, you know, the camp, you know, the the city is in charge of holding the video that for the library, and you know, so in, in circumstances like that, a lot of times there's there should already be a discussion that's occurred over, you know, that well the existing right now is they can't, you know, either depending on your lawyer, you can't turn it over, so now that that discussion would have to be well here this has changed a little bit. If it's not under the control of the library, but it's under the control of another entity and points to the library, I think we right. should meet with whoever has control of those cameras and figure out what should happen if they get a FOIA request or some other um, request for that information. Right, I totally agree. All right, so so that goes to um, a couple more questions about the video. Is there anything in the amended law that would prohibit camera footage that includes public access computer screens? So if the screen was actually in the, um, in the, in the footage. I think that if that screen has if it's just say the the like for example um in libraries i've worked at you might have a patron that looks up a book and then the patron walks away and then the screen to the computer still is reflecting that catalog record from in the online you know opac and if you're talking about that kind of situation where then okay the surveillance footage is showing an unoccupied computer with a screen and the screen is legible i would say you know no, that's fine, that that is not um, part of, because the idea is that the information as connected to a person, if you have a person sitting at the computer, active, you know, and, and there's a screen visible, and that person is not the person that your issue you're dealing with, then that I think would be a problem. But if it's just a, a unoccupied computer and the screen just happens to have something on it, I don't think that that's a problem and well and i think too that um you know the the library definition of you know surveillance video can't have personally i don't like you can't have that information on there so at times you may have to, and we do this with i do this with when i work with police agencies all the time there may be um instances where you will give over the photo or give over the surveillance but you will have redacted or blurred out the you know specific content mm -hmm. if it's not that now for example if you've got a video camera and and it's straight on a computer screen and the person is looking at child pornography that's not protected by the first right. amendment yes you can give it to them right. but if um if you're looking at child pornography you can see that and the patron next to that person is looking at something legitimate you may have to um redact that information in order to give it out or or you require a warrant and then the court will decide whether you can give that out without any redactions. So, but if you voluntarily give it out under the new act, I would redact the um, information that shows what materials they, they're looking at, even if the person is, is a subject of the, of the thing. But is that just based on personal experience, that probably doesn't happen that much because I don't right. think most libraries have cameras that are that focused where you can actually see that type of information. Right. Right. It's, it, I think it's more often going to be someone, you know, either sitting and, and reading or someone carrying something. But again, I, I think part of the equation is the person who is holding that book, let's assume they're not the person that you're actually looking for. Um, it, it has to be identifiable too, because it's the connection between the person and the item. Mm 
and, and you might actually, this might be a, a situation in which you rethink your um, locations of your cameras, because if you felt very comfortable before that, look, we can put our cameras anywhere, they have to have a search warrant, we have our opportunity to ad address it in a search warrant, but you might want to rethink the angles of your cameras if, in fact, that this is going to be a, um, a concern for you. And I, 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 I agree. Yeah. I think that answered Mary's question too then. So um, Andrea asked, um, we've caught crimes on our exterior, exterior video footage on other buildings in the area. Are we able to share footage that isn't directly related to a library focused crime event? Can you say that again? It's about, it's about um, exterior footage that happens at, uh, in another area. So maybe not on library property in another building that's close by. Are they able to share that information, that footage, um, if it's not? I, I think if it doesn't show any identifiable material, yeah. I mean, this is sort of been a common question right. that, you know, what's, who's a, you know, because before you can only, you know, you have to protect patron library records, right? Well, who's a patron? Is a person walking in front of the library a patron? Are they a patron when they steal a bike from the bike rack? You know, who knows? Because if, if they steal a bike one day and then come in and check out a book the next day, I mean, <laughs> it's not, I don't know if you can be a situational patron. So I think, I, to me, I'm comfortable releasing it as long as it doesn't have, as long as you can't see that, you know, the person's not carrying a stack of books and you can read all the titles. So. Right. I agree with that. Good. Um, going down, um, Leslie had another question about what does library employee mean in an academic library context? Does the university's governing board count? Is it only the library dean and people who work specifically for the library? Um, if the entity is sued, it would be the university as a whole? My, from working in academia for a really long time, working at big universities, um, I know every university is a little different. Um, my take on this is that um, uh, the library employee, as far as employee is, is it would be anybody who is being paid to work in the library. But as far as um, the higher level, I would think that it is the university would be able to be sued. I don't know what what Anne thinks, but and and if the, the libraries I've worked at were the were the law school, so in that instance, I would think that it would be the the um it would be the you know the law school whoever is managing the library the head of the library and then potentially also the university what do you think Anne? yeah i think that's probably accurate i i i don't i don't know enough i don't i don't have a lot of um you know background with the government you know it might depend on each instance so this is one of those things where you might have to talk, you know, usually universities have corporate counsel. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would maybe talk to your, um, you know, the university's corporate counsel just to verify what impact mm -hmm. it is. I mean, I think ultimately it ends up being the university depending on like what agreement, like for example, like law schools where I worked, what agreement the law school has with the university. But I think it's, yeah, it usually ends up with the university. That's the the deep pockets there, the entity. <laughs> with the <reason. laughs> yeah, yeah. Me Megan Buck asked if an employee has personal knowledge and they pass it along to library leadership, would that still be considered personal knowledge if a director communicates it to law enforcement? So you mean like if an employee has personal knowledge and the employee tells the director, is it now personal knowledge of the director? I would say yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Oh, easy, easy question. <laughs> um, is it okay to look up patrons' phone number from an ILS system to call about a code of conduct issue that happened within the library on a previous day? Are are you calling the patron? It sounds. I don't know. It didn't say. Um, M. Whoever M is. If uh, if you. If you're looking up that number to then call the patron and address it, I would think that's okay. Yeah. If you look, yeah. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's all right. Go ahead. I, I think it's really important. This brings up an important point. This only really applies and liability only applies if it goes outside the organization. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, we get this a lot with using like patron lists. If you are a library and you send out a newsletter and use the patron list, you're not giving – 
you know, that's perfectly acceptable. It's an, it's, an, it's an organizational activity. If you give that patron list to the friends of the library, for example, so they can use it on a millage campaign, mm -hmm. then you're giving that information to a third party and that's problematic. So here, I think as long as the, the phone number is being used by the library or an agent of the library, that it wouldn't be a violation. Or, or if you're giving that list to a munis your municipality. Mm -hmm. I've had that question recently. You, yeah. And now those lines can get blurred, but yeah. the municipality is not um, Correct. the library, right? So another question, um, this didn't have, this doesn't have to do with the amended, um, the act, but um, they were wondering what other libraries do with minor records and allowing access to parents, legal guardians. Would a library policy cover that? Yes, should be covered yeah. in your, typically in your circulation policy. Um, you have to, the parent has to accept financial responsibility for the return of the material. That's the way that Library Privacy Act is I don't have it verbatim, but that's the way right. it works. So typically what you do is make the parent sign and sign to that statement using very specific language that's in the Library Privacy Act, and then they can have access to that, that material. Um, and that's true too of things like, um, you know, guardians that are not for children, mm -hmm. you know, guardians in the case of disabled or, um, you know, other situations where it may not be a minor. And Anne, one of the questions before, it was answered on chat, but just to make sure that we captured it all, what policies do you think need to be amended at the at, at, at the libraries? What Which ones should I we- I saw that the chat, and the, whoever was taking notes in the chat took good notes, because oh, <laughs> the ones that I mentioned are the surveillance policies. Um, there's typically a confidentiality policy. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, um, could be something in the patron behavior policy. So that's the other thing, or the FOIA policy. It's less likely, but those should be reviewed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just for library privacy interests in general, you, again, you might want to review your circulation policy to make sure you have that language in place that would allow parents or other guardians to have access to, to other materials. So that's a good idea. Right. And I guess I, I would uh, support, and I know that the two of you would support um, passing this act along to any of the attorneys that the libraries are working with so that they can help to revise those policies um, with them, so. And I also think like Anne had mentioned before that um, the idea of making sure that there is a, a chain of command as far as if you are going to provide information externally that, you know, uh, staff members or some kind of procedure whereby the director is consulted before the information is given. Um, otherwise, you have to make very, you know, sure that every member of the staff understands, you know, what what the library's feeling is on, you know, what's a crime and, and you know, when things can be given out and when they can't. And so that's, again, I think that, you know, having that process that, you know, it needs to go through a kind of a chain of command situation um, is important too. So one, uh, one more pretty large question, I think that um, about three of them have just asked is, th is there a requirement for how long you have to keep the video surveillance for um, now that a person has 180 days for FOIA that is not feasible unless the video is backed up? Um, uh, how long does security camera footage have to be retained? Um, and uh, I will get to the other one after you answer that. <laughs> I, and I'm going to issue an apology because I told Claire that I'd look this up. It, this is not changed. Yeah. I'm actually looking it up right now. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, it's, so Michigan has a record retention policy that's approved for libraries. It's on the state of Michigan website. Um, Claire, I don't know if that's anywhere on, you, you know, I know you put links to a lot of materials, but. Um, yeah, it's on, it's on there. I believe it's 60 days. So Claire's gonna look. And and Claire, I, I apologize to the group. I have to drop off um, after this question, so. Oh, no problem. And and um, on the, the slides that we're handing out to everybody um, is contact information for all three of us. So that if if you have a question, don't hesitate to, to send a note. Um, an email or a phone number uh, or a call because, you know, just wanted to make sure everyone knew that there was a way to get in contact. I think it's down. Uh, wait. Now I want to know. 
Uh, payroll deduction and insurance. Is it searchable, Claire? Uh, yes, security it's log, surveillance video. Here it is. Yeah. Um, retain until recording is created plus two months. Two months. So not, not exactly six, 60 days, depending on the <laughs> month, but two months. Well, I thank everybody for the opportunity to, to speak to you all about this issue. It's, it's really important and I appreciate uh, the great questions too. So I, I'm sorry, I have to leave a little bit early. So thank you. No, thank you, Anne. I have just a couple more questions then. Um, um, but did that answer, so, so 60 days versus the 180 days, is there a, what happens between that, Claire? What's the? Oh, you're talking about the 180 days to bring a suit? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, if, if surveillance, let's see, I guess if it's possible that the surveillance footage would just be gone, um, I think if there is a, a, chances are if the surveillance footage, um, if so, let's see, no, I guess, I guess the surveillance footage would very much likely be gone and the, the, the plaintiff would have to come up with some other kind of evidence. Okay. So what if a uh, website searches in view on computers rather than catalog search? Um, you mean in surveillance mm -hmm. footage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, any, um, the idea is that any information that someone is looking at would be covered by that by that it doesn't have to be you know uh patron records is if i'm sitting at a computer and i'm looking up oh i don't know i'm looking up makeup tips or i'm looking up you know whatever on a computer and then next to me is someone you know doing something inappropriate or something illegal and their surveillance footage catches both screens both of us sitting at the screens um whatever's on my screen if it's readable uh would have to be redacted would have to be blurred it doesn't matter what what the information is if th the idea is that any information i choose to view um as someone who's you know l legally doing that is protected and then the last question in the chat at least is um from nick when camera footage is stored at the company server in the cloud instead of hosting it ourselves would that be an issue of the Privacy Act? Reason why I ask, because that company has access to that data. I'd rather, I'd rather host it on our own network um, video recorder, video server. So that has to do with the third party. Right, one of the things that this amendment does is uh, the section that you know defines employee and agent specifically says that any entity under contract with the library so if you if you have your surveillance video hosted or your ILS for that matter hosted in another in another place by another company then you're doing that via contract and so that company that is hosting your information is also bound by this and so that's a conversation that has to occur between you and that company. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of licensing contracts now do include a line that talks about um, binding the, the, the um, company, the, the service that you're getting to any uh, privacy laws, because there's a lot of states that are doing this now. But I would make sure, and then that's a conversation once this law goes into effect between you and your uh, contractors to ensure that they understand that they are bound by this. But but anyone you contract with is bound by this. And that includes, you know, uh, Hulu or Ancestry or anybody where you have patrons that have to input information in order to access it. Um, that and any information that that company retains um, is also covered by this. So um, all of the companies that you deal with that have digital information retain any kind of information on your patrons is covered by this. I will also say that when, as we were at the kind of at the last seconds after we got to the house level of, of uh, approving um, the amendments, that's when the ACLU actually asked us to add stronger language for contractors 
Um, and so we obliged um, knowing that uh, we wanted their support as, as well. Um, so that was, we, we created, I think, as strong of language with, for contractors as possible and those, a, those agents, um, which, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you might not have had, it might have all been internal. So, um, so just recognize that that was something that we paid um, really close attention to as well. But it does require you to go out and, and to make sure that they have the same language and that they're abiding by those that the Privacy Act in the same way that the library is. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll maybe Claire, I'll ask if anybody wants to unmute and ask any other questions. There's nothing else in the chat at this point. So, um, and I think we answered everything, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think I, I went through one by one. Uh, the slides will be available. Um, just, I see a question there. Um, as soon as today, um, an email will go out to everyone who registered for this and the slides will be attached. Um, and uh, let's see, can we share, was that asked? Can we share footage not directly related to a library focused crime event? Yeah, I think we answered that. Um, anybody else? Oh, Leslie wants to follow up. Can, Leslie, why don't you just unmute? Mute. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I didn't get from your answer, when you compared the university library to a municipal building, it, it wasn't clear whether you understood that the cameras that I have are inside my library right. and they are owned and maintained by the campus police, not university security, but actually law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any access to that footage for, for the most part. I can track gate count essentially mm -hmm. through part mm -hmm. of their security system. Does that change your answer any when it's actually owned by law enforcement? Right. So your campus, um, and I believe, uh, I know MSU and Wayne State, and I'm guessing UM have their own police force that is right. Yeah, and that's included yeah. as a definition of law enforcement too, our campus right. police. Right. Um, if if your campus police hold on to your library footage, yep. then that's a conversation that needs to happen between um, you and your, or the library and the campus police. Yep. Um, because the library, the, the law doesn't really address who's holding the footage. The fact that the cameras are in the library um, doesn't really matter who owns the camera. The, it's still part of that library record equation if it's if it's displaying uh, information that attaches a particular type of information to a patron then that would be you know something you can't give but if it's you know for all other purposes to you know find someone who committed a crime that would be uh, permissible you would be able to divulge that so depending on how your law enforcement agency deals with those requests because my guess is that they also deal with FOIA requests probably yeah. well they for might other, FOIA requests come through a different channel so they might right. so I, I, I will say that I, that the answer helps clarify for me in one way that because it is university police and connecting to the other question of the university ultimately being liable at right. that point, I remove myself from any individual liability because the police are making the decision. The chief of police and I have an excellent relationship mm -hmm. and we've talked about this issue before, but he'd be the one making the decision. The university as a whole would be the one liable because the library is not an independent entity. Right, right. So for me, right. it's more of an intellectual ethical issue than a right. legal Right, liability. well, this, yeah, I mean, this is very situational. You know, mm -hmm. and and because you know, let's let's say that for the sake of argument that there's a situation where um, the the campus police want to release information that you don't feel is appropriate for whatever reason. Whether there's a student that you know was was let's say there's a student that's alleged to be some kind of um, you know. Um, well, let's say that it's uh, someone who went to the Capitol, you know, mm -hmm. event. Yep. And, you know, there are people being arrested all over the place for that. And a lot of it is Facebook and, and things that people were, you know, let's say that they're alleging that 
you know, there was, he was at the library computer and they want to know if he was uh, searching, um, you know, a white supremacist or some other kind of problem. Um, I, I, I think rather than that, I think the, the bigger risk would be the exclusionary rule. Because right. we would have, I think the, the bigger risk that the chief of police on campus and I have discussed is what happens if he turns on these cameras because of an active shooter, is there a risk that that footage would then be excluded from any criminal prosecution? We've got a little less of that now because of the new law. So that, right. that really removes that issue of the exclusionary rule, which had been my bigger concern. Right, right. And just for everyone else, what you're talking about is the possibility that if, if information is inappropriately turned over, um, then the defense attorney could get it thrown out. Um, of the court litigation and then it can't be used if it's inappropriately turned over. And right, I think, again, you know, there's lots of things that could compl complicate this, but the fact that your um, uh, law enforcement um, agency, uh, let's see, if it's their cameras, um, then they would, well, I think they would likely be responsible for, for that for that the release of that footage now if you disagreed with it and you were somewhere on record you know telling your law enforcement i don't think this is right that may impact a judge's decision on whether to exclude it or not but i think ultimately the the law enforcement would be would be the ones who would have make that ultimate decision if that's what they're charged with by the university um, universities are very unique little ecosystems of <laughs> and laws like this aren't written for us. So right. I appreciate that academic libraries are included in it. It's very important that we're included in it and that we have these protections. But it's clear that these laws don't really take us into account when they think about our governing structure. Yeah, and, and it's so hard because every, you know, I've worked in four universities and every one of them is different. You know, there are some constants, but it differs if you're if you're a, a, a professional school versus the university library versus they all work differently. Um, so that makes it very difficult. But you're right. And that's something, again, your university's council would probably, you know, if I were your law enforcement or if I were you, I would send it to them before information was released. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Our, our lawyer has been brought into the conversation. Yeah. Already. It's just not as high a priority as other conversations. Yeah. yeah. And I just, yeah. I think, Leslie, I think you said something too that I just want to reemphasize because I, it was, you said, I have a really strong relationship with, mm -hmm. with the campus police. Oh, yeah. And, and I would encourage you, I know that um, we went through the slides fairly quickly, but I think that um, Claire and Ann and I yesterday had a really long conversation about building those relationships. If you don't know, you, if you don't know your law enforcement, um, it's really important that you get to know them. You build that relationship before an issue happens. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I got a, um, I just, you know, there's, there's some information that we've shared here today. Um, I would definitely share the act with them. Um, let them read it through. And then if they have questions, they can come and, and ask you. But um, I'm not sure, you know, sharing the, the presentation with them is, is the most appropriate thing because this is obviously for library directors to know. Um, and we've been cautioned about, um, you know, I, you know the, the things that are happening in our world today. We're cautioned about some of the um, the the work of law enforcement and and um, I, I'll go back to the hostile witnesses many times the light when when we were asking the questions and vetting you all um, for information about changing this act many of you talked about being hostile witnesses and that law enforcement never pursued a warrant if you had something happen in the library never pursued it because they always you know they always said that you know it was too hard to get a warrant so that you were just kind of left it was just like you know so so building that relationship and making sure that you have that you know a, a real good rapport with law enforcement um, is is really part of this conversation at the same time um, and making sure that they know um, that you have you have the ability, but you don't have to. You and Claire was really specific. You do not have to share this information if your policies do not go in this mm -hmm. direction. 
So, um, so this is a, you know, you don't have, it's not a must. It was a, definitely a, you may. Right. And, and it's true that a lot of this, especially for academic libraries, kind of falls into like a hole, <laughs> like a, like a, a you know, a, a black hole, um, because, and which it happens a lot in libraries for general with other laws. You know, it's uh, you, sometimes I think, well, laws were created for everybody but libraries because the situations are so unique in a lot of libraries. And, and I think academic libraries are particularly um, that, they're even more so. So a lot of this is, again, conversations and, and with between your law enforcement and your lawyer and, you know, and it's because it is, I think a lot of this is going to be very situational. We're not really sure what's, what's going to happen because there's just no, there's absolutely no precedence on this. There's no cases or anything for us to look at to try to guess. And even in other states with similar language, there just isn't a lot. So we're all kind of just kind of feeling our way around. You know, I would add at the university level, our police chiefs are talking to each other. So That's when good. I talk to, they're talking uh, when the amendments to the Library Privacy Act were first uh, were first presented, and I talked to our police chief and I talked to uh, their university's rep in Lansing, and um, the police chief told me that he was talking to his counterparts at the other public universities, mm -hmm. and so they're talking to each other. I think having a, us in that dialogue with them is particularly important. Yes, because you, there are times when you may have different priorities. Remember, this doesn't go into effect until March 28th. Um, so we have a little bit more time for you to revise those policies and, and get your procedures in, in place and build that relationship and share the act with, mm -hmm. with law enforcement. Right. So. And talk to your lawyers. <laughs> Always talk to your lawyers. I can't emphasize that enough. It's worth it to have a lawyer on retention uh, if you can, if you can afford it. Um, it's definitely worth the money. Um, we are a little bit past time for our, our Zoom. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, it was really nice to see all of you today. I hope that we see all of you again tomorrow, uh, Friday for the director's call. Um, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Please don't hesitate to give us a shout out if there's anything uh, that we can help you with or if you have any questions about this.